see nothing but my own you dead on the screen. And believe me, after editing video for the last nine months, the last thing I want to be looking at right now is my face again. But <laughs> it seems to be my face these days, to be locked in video confrontation with my virtual self. Um, uh, I was just telling, my, there are nine of us from my fa the face-to-face -face class, um, students from Duke, UNC, and NC State, all in this class. And we thought we'd planned pretty well. And in fact, the people at Coursera told us the first week of the MOOC would be all about technical problems. And we've had very few technical problems on the MOOC. And in fact, instead, have been engaged in incredibly interesting conversations that you all in the MOOC have started this week. But um, no one told us to plan for a snowstorm that would close Duke for longer than it's been closed in the whole 25 years I've taught at Duke. Um, so today is our third class meeting. We meet for four and a half hours. Staggered groups of people come in during that time, and we pretty much plan what we're going to be doing um, in terms of interacting with the, the virtual students. And now here we are having to use a Google Air Hangout to virtually plan how to interact with virtual students this week. So um, it's a bit of a, a technical snafu called weather. Uh, and uh, that's just what we're going to deal with. Um, we were going to start with an exercise called Think, Pair, Share, but I can think of no clever virtual way to do it. Think, Pair, Share is a way for introverts to also have participation, and it's a great way to get a conversation started. And um, what you do is you ask people to write three things on a note card, and I was going to ask all of the face-to-face -face students to write the three most interesting things that came out of their first week interacting with the students um, on course in on course on the Coursera uh, MOOC, and then you share that with one other person in the class, and together you decide what one thing you're going to talk about in the class, and then class discussion is going around and having people read off the one thing, and that means everybody in the class has had a, it's a fantastic pedagogical trip, because it means everybody in the class, no matter how shy you are, has had some chance to actually do something interactive cognitively. Uh, articulately, intelligently with somebody else in the class. And I, I typically do that in a normal class. I do that almost every single class time to make sure we're hearing from minority opinions in the class. Uh, it's another way to make difference our operating system. Since we can't do think, pair, share with index class um, um, cards now, can we just go around to the class and have you one by one, you'll have to just jump in and take turns, one by one talk about the most interesting thing that came out of your experience with the MOOC this semester, this um, week. I've got, I've got a list here. Barry, you're on the first of my list, so why don't you start it off? Um, yeah, sure. Can everyone hear me really uh, clearly? Pretty clearly. Yeah. Okay, good. If I'm too quiet, let me know. I can um, uh, rank up the uh, the gain on my microphone. Um, so. Uh, the first thing that was really interesting was, um, well, this weekend I had to write a paper, so I didn't get as much time to interact, but I went and did my um, initial hello to the community on the um, staff introductions, and uh, I got three responses, and one of which was really interesting because they brought up um, Brian Baker's MOOC on big data and education that I not only just took. Uh, when it was being offered, but also Ryan Baker came to our university, came to our data mining class, and gave a presentation in person to us uh, at NC State. So that was pretty cool. Wow. That's very cool. Uh, on one of the MOOCs I saw, somebody had taken that famous design class at Penn, where the MOOC actually together, collectively, did a design project. Um, and they didn't say what the project was. I think it's been run several times now. But that class always ends with a huge design sprint where everybody online does some kind of design project. And that seems very cool as well. Another way to break through the confines of a move. Uh, Tina, I have your name down. Do you want to go next? And then other people will just let you fall, fall in so I don't have to call on everybody. But Tina, do you want to Sure. sure. I'll, um, I'll go ahead. And I think for me the most interesting part uh, of watching the MOOC this week was seeing where everybody can, comes from. Um, I wrote a little bit about that in my blog for the Chronicle of Higher Education and I really just enjoyed watching the pins go up on the map and uh, also seeing some of the ways that people 
interacted with each other and saying hi from different parts of the world, sometimes in different languages. Um, I found that to be really neat. Yeah. By the way, everybody, Tina's blog should be up um, when we end this call. Her blog should be up, unless it's already up. Already up. It wasn't a minute ago, but uh, I just got a message that it was. So. Wow! Congratulations. That's very exciting. Thank we'll you. Um, after class, everybody, please be tweeting that out and getting out the word for, for Tina so we can get as many readers as possible. Cliff, what about you? Well, um, I think the most interesting thing I saw was the interaction between um, virtual spaces and, um, you know, um, real-world space, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, I saw one interview, I'm trying to recall who it was, but one of the posts in the forum on um, your favorite teacher, one of the uh, people went around and interviewed people that uh, he or she knew. I'm not actually sure um, of the gender of this person, but in any case, um, there, was an, there was this interaction between those two spaces, and I thought that was uh, a curious development, and um, I was just curious to see that. Nice. Did you um, jump in at all and say anything to anybody? Not on that one, but on other ones, I tried to. Um, I tried to sort of. Well, I, I saw a couple other posts where people had. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm seeing also is a certain habit where people are restraining themselves a bit and saying, "Well, I was. Um, I was very inspired by a lot of teachers that I've known in my life, but since this is about academia." I'll restrict myself to this professor that I knew. So um, with one person, I tried to suggest maybe they could also tell a story about this these people that they knew outside of an academic context, and that would be OK. Um, and that's sort of what we're after. So um, yeah, so I, I, that was more where I was trying to participate. That's great. Um, I, I would just like to kind of piggyback off of what both um, Tina and Cliff have said. Am I showing up? Yeah. You can hear me and everything? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Definitely. Um, I, I think that both of those things were just so um, massively awe-inspiring for me, seeing the vast diversity of people in the course, the numbers of people, and already like looking into the forums, there's already such a really amazing sense of community going on. Um, and that to me is really empowering. And um, I, probably my favorite thing was reading, um, it was about who your favorite teacher is, and um, this person told a story, her favorite teacher was someone that she met, um, well I don't know that she even met, met her, but was from YouTube. And I responded and um, told her about um, the anthropology of YouTube. Um, there's a, a link that I posted. Because I thought that was really powerful and really spoke a lot about what we're trying to do as far as build a community here. And it also spoke to me in my personal artwork. I do a lot of um, contemplating on internet communities and that type of thing. So that to me was, was really interesting and, and got me really excited about this whole thing. I guess I should go since we was talking. Um, hi, I'm Jade. Um, I'm one of the community TAs, um, but in terms of how I act on the internet, I'm a back channeler and a lurker. So I've spent a lot of times in the forums, but the place where I've been the most active has been on Twitter. And it's been really interesting to see the types of conversations that are happening about the MOOC outside of the MOOC and the different communities that are forming. Um, I think it's really inspiring to see how people are sort of taking the information that is in this central repository of Coursera and turning it into their own learning space. Um, that's really inspiring for me because I have my own feelings about Coursera that I've been very vocal about um, all over the place. And it's just nice to see smaller communities forming in spaces where people are most comfortable. And I'm really, really excited to have so many active Twitterers um, participating in the class and having a hashtag we can follow for that. That's been really, really fantastic. Yes, I hope at the end of the class we can do a project where we starify all, <laughs> all the future at Tweet. It's quite great. I go on a couple times a day, too, and do Twitter debates with people. It's very interesting. 
been fantastic. Hi, this is Matthew Clark. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I just wanted to share a few of the things that uh, I encountered this week. Um, one thing that was really interesting for me was seeing how uh, the community of thousands modified the Constitution, the community Constitution on the Coursera wiki page. Um, I think everyone did a really great job with that. Also on the forums, um, I was extremely pleased to see such an interesting and informed discussion of a lot of different issues. One topic that uh, I participated in discussing uh, concerns education often seen as job training and nothing else. So I'm really interested in this dichotomy between higher education on the one hand or um, I, I don't know conceptually how to formulate it, but maybe higher education on the one hand and job training on the other, there being a distinction between the two, or job training as a special kind of higher education. And there are just some really insightful posts on the forum here uh, in response to some of the questions that I asked. In particular, one that discusses the higher education contribution scheme that exists in Australia. And I really look forward to um, the discussion that we're going to have in the coming weeks about the different kinds of higher education, what higher education might look like in the future, and also how we'll pay for it. Um, it's, it's really interesting to me. Matt, I missed that one. If you um, find it again and you can send me some kind of a place, let me know where that is. I'd love to read that because I, I actually um, have a note to myself someplace on the Google Doc saying about the higher ed um, contribution scheme of Australia because when we do higher ed from scratch, I want us to really think about how you pay for education and that's a model that's so interesting. Australia has gone in so many interesting di um, directions recently on so many social issues. And um, the higher education issue is a key one. Will do. I'll post the link, Kathy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I want to learn more. I guess I'll go since I'm last. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Max. I'm one of the community TAs. Um, I think for me what was most impactful and certainly surprising was just the the level Matt talked about too, but the level of insight and also just the honesty and the conversation that I was having with a complete stranger. Um, for me, I, I uh, um, started a conversation with someone who posted about their favorite teacher. And the person had already given a very kind of descriptive um, uh, commentary on why this person was important and sort of like what the tools this uh, professor used to make their class impactful. And so uh, I just went and just asked why that was, and then after that he proceeded to give a very long, detailed explanation of the use of um, journal entry and, and keeping a diary while studying ethics and applying that to their personal life, and then moving into how this format could be applied into a MOOC and how that could be used to build in social inequality issues. It was just such a thoughtful uh, answer and something I certainly, I've never really seen on my own on, on the internet. Um, so. That was for me to That's great. Um, I'm going to read out a question from uh, Leslie, whose apartment didn't have enough bandwidth for her to be able to do a Google Hangout. And that's so important because that issue of access has to be an issue um, for us. In fact, we're going to be redoing a bunch of the um, Coursera MOOCs at lower bandwidth because a number of people want to download them and just can't have all that bandwidth on in, on the systems they have. So we're going to try to make it a little bit more equitable um, by putting it on lower bandwidth. I know there are communities I've heard from all over the world. There's one in New Zealand, there's one in Africa, there's some in India where people meet in local McDonald's um, that advertise high bandwidth so they can meet together and download together because they don't have enough bandwidth in their particular homes. But um, that's a real issue. Anyway, Leslie's apartment building didn't have enough bandwidth, or maybe she's in a dorm and didn't have bandwidth. But I think on the Coursera platform, she sent something that Casey then did on Jabber to me on a chat, which I'm going to read on Google Hangout Air, and maybe we can have a discussion in this. Um, Leslie writes, what would it take to get employers to design what we like to call massive open online programs by building the already existing MOOCs into a playlist-like format? We've built the technology to make that possible, but don't know how to get them excited to do it. 
So um, that's interesting. I guess she found. Uh, Casey, can you jump in here? Is that Leslie found this in one of the forums on Coursera? Yeah, so for this Google Hangout, we um, posted a new forum in Coursera in our office hours, and Leslie is in that forum trying to respond to people or pull out questions as she sees them, and so she just um, she actually texted me um, <laughs> that someone had written a question, and so I went and looked and then chatted it to you. So, sorry, that's a long answer, but, um, so the original post was, um, by someone with the username Bassem. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Excellent. So, she's, they were basically saying employers could make a playlist of Coursera courses that they're, they thought their employees should take, or that would be part of vocational training. Is that the thrust of this? Yeah, so they developed um, Skill Academy um, to build a cross-university program, um, but they're concerned about who will give accreditation, um, right? They're looking at uh, their own company giving accreditation versus accreditation bodies that were designed for the last information age or employers um, that are more forward-looking. So, but they're trying to figure out how to situate themselves um, and how to get people excited um, and wrap around accreditation. And the thought that occurred to me was actually badges. I don't know if that's something we want to introduce in this Hangout. Well, we may do, because we're going to have a whole unit on badges later on. We might want to wait and talk about that. But I want, I, I, thanks for um, summarizing that. I want to make a couple of comments just to play off what people have said so far. For me, one of the most um, memorable things that happened in the MOOC this week, um, and it plays off Jade's comment because I also um, started out being quite critical of MOOCs, and in fact, I think this week in uh, or this month in a magazine called Public Culture, I'm very critical of the elitist nature of MOOCs. And a whole bunch of people on Coursera were pretty mad at me for calling it elitist because they did not see themselves as participants as being elitist. And I hung back and watched the conversation, and this brilliant conversation arose where people were talking about all the different ways that MOOCs are and are not elite. I didn't really have to add anything at all, except I did come on after about 10 comments just to add my own point of view, which is um, changing a lot. Uh, and one reason I decided to do a MOOC was because I hate being critical of something without getting in and knowing the guts of it and seeing how they work. And one thing that bothers me is you have to be pretty wealthy as an institution to sign on to Coursera. You're making a big institutional commitment of staff salaries and time uh, to do it. Two, I think you pretty much have to be a pretty senior person to do a MOOC or just not care about um, the normal rubrics of professionalization because they take an enormous amount of time. Um, Casey and I figured we were spending 40 hours a week beginning in May to make a MOOC and that's an awful lot of time. Excuse me, there goes my phone. Um, so, um, uh, you know, that's another version of elitism. On the other hand, what we're trying to do by having this whole Future Ed initiative is extend the MOOC out there to the community so anyone anywhere can be part of a conversation and think, use this simply as a springboard to get a conversation, as a catalyst to get a conversation going in their own locale, wherever that may be. So the people uh, who were part of that conversation on the MOOC were really concerned not to be written off as elitist when these were people at community colleges, people who were adjuncts, people who were unemployed who were having very, very energetic conversations with one another and the MOOC was sort of a opportunity for that or an organizing principle for that that um, allowed that to get together. You certainly wouldn't need the MOOC to do that by any means, but it was interesting that they found it useful for that. So. Um, as a community building tool, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the comment that Leslie found and is responding to, um, I think it's for Sarah that has started developing these things called specializations, which allow you to fill in and around a traditional higher education curriculum with a series of courses where you can build your own specialization. And we'll talk about badging later, which is precisely not a grading system, an alternative system of recognizing pathways that will help you make a career that is not a, a career recognized by your university. To me, that's a very fruitful area. 
And I don't think it'll put anybody at the particular university out of a job. So for example, I teach at a university that has no information school, uh, where the computer science department is extremely um, theoretical and has very, very few uh, applied courses at all. Um, there's no library science school. There's no school of education. Uh, because of those things, there's many things having to do with um, digital worlds, which we simply don't have places to offer, except for one non-credit program that I actually helped to design um, in 1998 um, called ISIS, Information Science Plus Information Studies. Last year, um, we had to turn away 200 students who had signed up for ISIS courses because it's a non-degree program and way underfunded, and everyone who teaches in it basically does it as an add-on. It's not a, a core department at the university. This year, because somebody realized that about 90% of those computer students who wanted a basic computer science and a web design and web uh, computer programming for the web computer course were women, and that's a real problem that there aren't enough women in computer science fields. Um, a dean, Robert Calderbank, our dean of natural sciences at the time, came up with funding for that class. But all of that's ad hoc and an add-on. And the Coursera specialization basically says in every university there are different kinds of ad hocs and add-ons. And on top of your regular degree program, you can take online courses, courses at other universities, and use this specialization system to sort of add a component to what's missing at your university. I, I would love to have you guys talk about that. Um, Matt, I know you've worked many years as an adjunct, and you have really strong feelings about that. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. I have, and um, Professor Davidson, it's a, it's a shame to hear that ISIS or interdisciplinary uh, studies is uh, somewhat underfunded. And I can tell you from my own experience that there are several different disciplines that are primary, primarily occupied by adjuncts. Um, these, you know, low-paid, um, not well-supported uh, professionals that are highly qualified but they just don't receive what they need to succeed in a university environment. Right. I had a, qu a quick question for you, Professor Davidson. Um, do you think that there is an essential distinction between the kind of higher education that happens at universities and the kind of higher education that happens at community colleges? Or is there an essential, an essential distinction between job training and other types of higher education. And how, how might we relate that to what we learned this week um, as far as the four different um, eight ages and, and, the, and the information age that we're living in today? Well, first of all, I think we're, um, we're in a moment where we're defining job training very narrowly. And I love to point out the huge project Google uh, itself did two years ago it's called the Google Air Pro uh, No, I'm getting it wrong. I think it's called it Oxygen. It was the Google Oxygen project. It did a data mining uh, and a data meld and a data analysis of absolutely all of its employment records since it began. Everyone it had interviewed, everyone it had hired, everyone it had fired, everyone it had promoted. All of their step-by-step um, -step hierarchical evaluations everything about them in HR to find out um, what things constituted the person who was going to get a raise, who was going to exceed, uh, succeed, who was going to become a leader within Google. And you know Google's philosophy is you can only work in a field if you actually practice it. You have to have technical knowledge in the field. They were shocked, absolutely shocked, to find technical expertise did not make the top ten from their own data search of what were the qualities that got somebody promoted at Google. So here's a company that says technical vocational training is what matters for our managers. It does a huge database study of its own personnel records to find out what in fact does constitute success. And um, the article in the New York Times that described it said it was like an episode of um, uh, The Office. Uh, it was one of those bad things you see on the on the um, blackboard in the office. It's supposed to increase morale with stuff like plays well with others, uh, listens attentively, uh, is empathetic and set, set and um, concerned about others, is a good collaborator, reads critically, thinks creatively, writes 
comprehensively, communicates well, and somewhere like around 14 was has technical expertise in the field. So that made Google step back and really engage in another project, which I've been a little bit, not hugely, but a little bit involved in, that's about why, what is vocational training, and why don't we think play well, plays well with others, uh, is articulate, um, uh, speaks well, communicates well, why don't we think of those as vocational training? And if we do, we're talking about a much wider curriculum in all fields than we currently and typically deliver. I have to say it's partly because of that study that I started changing my classes around to focus so much on peer leadership, peer management, um, uh, giving classes over to students, deciding the syllabus and so forth. Uh, and that's why the second half of this class, Designing Higher Ed from Scratch, I'm going to be out of the picture and you guys will be um, leading the last half of the class. Um, but, um, you know, Amartya Sen says that all education is vocational in the sense that the real vocation of education should be, higher education should be training us all for productive, happy, socially engaged lives. And in that sense, everything, being a philosopher, being a historian, knowing something about your culture and other cultures, all of that's part of vocational training. Uh, you also asked a community college question, and I've um, taught in several community colleges, not for a long time, but I, I've taught in them, I've um, tutored in them and lectured in them much more recently. Um, I have close relationships with a lot of community colleges, and um, at one time when I was teaching at an extremely fancy school that shall be nameless, and one of my students was teaching at a local community college, we did an experiment where we had our students write their, their the same essays on the same topic without their name or their school on them and then we switched and had peer grading done at our respective schools and my very fancy school gave everybody A's and her community college gave everyone C's, C's pluses and were much more critical and then everybody was shocked at the end when they realized the class, the papers they graded were from the other institution. So in other words, the students in the fancy school got C pluses from the community college students students at the community college got A's from the students at the fancy school. Uh, it was quite an interesting experiment. Uh, it was a while ago, and I don't know if it would pass FERPA rulings now, but um, it, was sure, it, it was all anonymous, but um, it was a bit of a rug pull at the end. But I think the quality of, high, of education at many community colleges is extraordinary. Um, and the teachers who teach at them are quite valiant because they have a very hard teaching load. Somebody else want to jump in and talk about any of these topics? Um, I wanted to bring in the small conversation Barry and I are having in the group chat. I don't think everybody that's watching can see it. Um, but in terms of the question about creating playlists and making the classes available to people outside of the Coursera platform, I think one of the things that we often don't talk about is issues with licensing um, and the role that open source has in this and that you know, Coursera is a proprietary platform. Um, they have rights to the content. I know that in addition to it being hard to make a MOOC, you have to sign on to lots of distribution agreements. And that would be a whole other level to consider. Um, and, oh, well, then I'm not hearing you. Uh, they're not actually, um, uh, they're not allowed to distribute my MOOC without my permission. Do you have the right to make it open source? No. Or open. Okay. no, 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 that's proprietary. Okay. So I think that it's a wonderful question to sort of think through in this class too, um, especially for thinking about the role of technology in education because we have the mantra that information wants to be free. And I think that's one of the reasons why the thing that's so exciting about, about this for me is the Twitter activity, the blog posts that are going up. It's people taking the information and sort of creating their own paths with it. But when you stay within the Coursera platform, you do have the limits on distribution and the inability to do that. And that's just um, something that might change over time. But right now, it's not necessarily a capability. And it's not what we're talking about. But it is part of how do we get information to learners. Yep, exactly. And that's exactly why we did the Future Ed blog, too, so that we could be moving information from one source to another without me being the only one. And that's also why it's so fabulous that all of you are blogging and tweeting and doing this as well. So it's a, there are many different filters. I agree. I could not agree more. 
Any other one? Anyone else want to participate or jump in here? With quiet people. I would be happy to if, if <laughs> I'm, I'm full of questions today. Go for it. Um, Professor Davidson, I just wanted to ask what you think, uh, or from your perspective, what is the most feasible solution to the adjunct crisis in American higher education today? Um, it, when, I, when I look at the issue, it looks extremely complex. And as a student, uh, as someone who's trying to design a solution, sometimes I become overwhelmed and I don't know what to do. What do you think we should do about the crisis, or what are some steps that we can take to try and remedy the problem? Well, I think the first step is the one that's happening right now, and that's a, a concerted adjunct movement where people make the crisis known. When I give talks, I always talk about adjunctification and contingent labor, and I've had audiences gasp when I say that right now, 70%, 7-0, Percent. It's actually higher than 70 percent of the labor force teaching in our colleges and community colleges and universities is adjunctive or contingent labor. Most people have no idea that that's the case. So I would say that's the first step is awareness. The second step is I think universities, and um, I'm going to be probably hated by that by some of my peers, but I refuse the sanctimony of thinking universities are somehow outside our society. The same kind of income inequality that's happened in our society has been taken over by the university. Um, in the 1980s, someone got the idea that somehow academics, faculty, and students couldn't run themselves, and that we needed corporations and we needed CEOs to run us. And the long, long, long trend of having um, professors run higher education was supplanted, and CEOs and former governors and former military men uh, mostly men, but not always former military people, former government officials started becoming college presidents. Well, when that happens, you're not, com you know, Duke is not competing with UNC to hire a college president. We're competing with IBM or AT&T to hire a college president. So suddenly the administrative scal um, salaries way escalated. Um, two, as universities become more and more complex, the academic infrastructure for universities gets higher and higher. And as more of the university is supported by indirect costs recovered from uh, corporate and government grants, the infrastructure gets higher. So we have a more and more of our uh, the tuition dollars or state tax dollars going to pay for infrastructures to build buildings and to make other amenities for universities. The actual cost. Uh, Ronald Ehrenberg is the smartest person, I think, in terms of the data of higher education, and he's discovered the cliche that higher education is costing more and more um, uh, and is outpacing inflation is wrong for public education if we take out the defunding of public education over the last 30 years by per student by um, taxpayer money the increase in numbers of students in um, universities, we've actually only had about a 0.5% per year inflation rate in the cost of tuitions at public universities. Uh, private universities have gone up a lot, but so have private nursing homes, so have private um, uh, kindergartens, anything where hand care, where there's li possibilities for libel and you need certain kinds of insurance and expectations of uh, a certain kind of person-to-person -person care, higher education in that world has not gone up more than comparable kinds of luxury items. And I think we right now have a situation where, I'm quoting Ron Ehrenberg again, he's a professor at Cornell, by the way, in case you're trying to look up his work, and he's done very brilliant work. Um, public education students are paying more for less, higher education, private university students are tending to pay more for a whole lot more. Um, you know, public, private universities are becoming much more like, uh, I mean, just phenomenally luxurious um, opportunities for engagement, uh, social life, athletics. Um, if you've seen those maps of who the highest paid me uh, person in any state are, it's typically a public school basketball or football coach, typically football coach, or a private or public school college president. 
um, something is kind of wrong with that. And you know, thinking about different schemes for paying for education, I hope, will be one thing we do in at least one of the colleges that we're designing, the higher education forms that we're designing from scratch um, in the second part of this course. It's a major social problem that is contiguous and continuous with the major social problem of income inequality that's happening actually throughout many countries in the Western world as well as in the developing world. I think Hong Kong, Singapore, and the United States are the top three for most radical um, differentiation of poorest and richest classes over the last decade. Anybody else want to jump in here with some comments? Maybe Jay, tell us a little bit about what's going on on the Twitter streams, or other people want to talk about their Twitter streams? I guess it's me again. Hi again. <laughs> Hi, you're chatting um, away. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting that's happening on the Twitter stream that I'm hoping other people will get into just because this is a class about education um, on an educational platform. It's very awesome and very meta. Um, is MOOC MOOC has become active again. Um, so there's a big history of educational technologists using um, Twitter as a way to engage with MOOCs. Um, I know that there was a live chat that happened at 1 p.m. today that I unfortunately missed. But if people aren't on Twitter and if you like having a back channel instead of posting on the forums like me, I would love to see more people engaging in conversation there. So. Yep, MOOC MOOC is great. Um, I would, I also, because of the snow day, I was doing make-arounds all day and I had to excuse myself, but it will be on again at 1 p.m. next week. And it's basically a back channel that's talking about all of these kinds of issues in a much more open uh, public forum. Although I hate to call Twitter uh, free. Um, you know, Twitter, the proprietary nature of Twitter is also very, very interesting. It's, a, it's also a corporate entity. And the data of, of Twitter also gets sold. So, you know, it's, a, it's also compromised. We do not live in pure world. But it's more open. Anyone else? I want to talk a little bit about one of the readings for this week. If we could, did you, I'm not sure if you had a chance with everything that was going on in our world this week to take a look at the chapter in the book David and I wrote on um, the future of thinking, and especially the chapter about institutions as mobilizing networks. Did, you, did anyone get to read that this week? Island. <laughs> so let, me, let me yeah, just say, I read it. Yeah. we were set a challenge um, by one of our editors to come up with a new definition of institutions. And being a deconstructionist, um, and David is a very much a deconstructionist, and I'm more of a just deconstructionist historical materialist, but definitely have a deconstructionist bent bank, bank too. We decided to think about what it would be like if instead of thinking of institutions as that which was stayed and fixed and foundational, we thought of institutions as places where energies that cannot be contained by the institution have a place to group and regroup and form themselves and uh, actually help to deconstruct, change the institution. So our definition, very cantankerous, which really upset a lot of political scientists, is that um, institutions are mobilizing networks. And by that we mean that um, any place where people gather and have a cultural purpose in gathering can be repurposed and remixed in a more anarchic, creative um, way that allows other kinds of things to flourish that were not planned into the basic foundations of the um, overriding institution. And for me, that is very, very exciting because it means that in any case, in any situation, whether it's a classroom, a university, a church, uh, a Girl Scout group, a school, a uh, 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 job, uh, there are energies at work that can be harnessed for other purposes. So one of my favorite um, examples recently is the Board at Work group. Do you all know about Board at Work? No. Board at Work is a group of people, I think it's Jonah um, Peretti 
Anyone can, can anyone correct that? Google it and find out if that's the right name. Um, where he will do certain, he now runs BuzzFeed, but um, he's the person who um, had a shoe designed at Nike, a Nike shoe designed, and wanted to have written on the customized shoe that you could have uh, made by Nike, this shoe was made by Sweatshop Labor, and they refused to do it and said that was against company rules. And he, rather like uh, Michael Moore, engaged in a letter campaign, an email campaign that went all the way to the CEO of Nike about why his Nike custom-made shoe couldn't say that it was made by Sweatshop Labor. And what he would do is take these emails and send them to his board at work contingent, who are basically disaffected workers all over the world, including Sweatshop workers, who would then translate that to other people and figure out social actions on the ground around the idea of Nike as a sweatshop labor organizer. So it was kind of pranksterish and used social media, but it also was organizing people who were bored at work as a force for thinking about the conditions of labor. And um, I think all institutions have those possibilities within them. So Jade, you're taking our Coursera things and going onto Twitter or MOOC MOOC, devouring our MOOC, um, and doing that in a kind of pranksterous, anarchic, irreverent way, to me is exactly what institutions are mobilizing network are supposed to inspire, to be thinking of us less as, because th here's my theory, I think institutions want us, in many cases, to feel powerless to change those institutions. And by thinking of institutions as a mobilizing network, we have the first step, and that goes back to your question, Matt, of what we can do, which is realizing we are not powerless, that there are all kinds of ways that we can band together and have an impact, and that our institutions often provide us with the tools, the offices, the warm spaces, the sandwiches in the classroom, uh, the bandwidth, and other opportunities by which we can do things that those institutions may not have thought of as part of their uh, founding mission. Love any comments that any of you might have on that. Yeah, I actually want to chime in really quickly. I, I think it's interesting and profound the number of tools, um, and, and by tools I actually mean online institutions, I suppose, right? Like Coursera we're using as a platform, but we're also using Haystack and Twitter and Rap Genius and all of these different um, online institutions that were built for very specific purposes, um, but in collaborating together and in working together, um, we're sort of cobbling together using all of these tools our own movement and our own form of communication um, that's happening in I think right now like four or five different places at once including old technology like text messages and um, and simple chats and emails uh, that we're sending back and forth on the back channels um, so yeah I think that this class is a great example of how you can work within and and at the same time outside of different institutions to build something entirely new um, that is a mobilizing agent. I, I also wanted to make a comment. I think um, a lot of of uh, the networks or the type of mobilizing networks um, that happen around Duke are also uh, represented in the Franklin Humanity Center's labs. And um, I think specifically about students or graduate students who are in traditional disciplines um, and want to collabor collaborate across fields but can't necessarily find a space to do that. Um, the labs have allowed uh, that sort of space, um, especially the PhD lab uh, where, you know, we're able, I, I who am in the uh, the field of history, am able to work with MFA students or people in classical studies. Um, I think one thing that is hard about that, uh, just as you were talking about in the um, the chapter, is that it doesn't necessarily compute <laughs> to people who are uh, in in our disciplines. So trying to um, translate you know what I do or even why I'm associated <laughs> or in the class um, as a history student can be very difficult if this is not immediately what my dissertation is about. Right. And that, I think that's such a great point because I think many of our disciplines don't recognize worlds that exist outside of the university. 
So if the function of your discipline is to train other people to occupy tenure track positions at similar kinds of institutions, then something like the PhD lab or even what we're doing in this class is quite invisible. If in fact you take seriously the fact that 70% of our profession is now contingent or adjunct labor and only a very small percentage of students who pursue PhDs actually replicate their professors' lives in tenure track jobs at similar kinds of PhD granting institutions, then every it's almost like what's in the disciplines is invisible to everything else out there in the world. Um, when we ran the Duke Steam Challenge this year, we asked the students for criticism and feedback. And one of the things the undergraduates said is, could you please tell us what you mean by STEAM? Because except in our classes, we don't really understand why something is science and technology versus art or social science. If you're doing a computer code, but you're doing a program that has to do with teaching, you have to deal with legality and you have to deal with ethics. So is that humanities or is that computer science? So it was a, you know, it was very interesting that they hadn't yet been educated into thinking in the narrow ways of disciplines. And when you are thinking in the narrow way of disciplines, other things are invisible. It's a kind of a mutual invisibility that happens. And what I hope is that we have opportunities in this class to break through that and understand a little bit about what kinds of disciplinary make assumptions make other things invisible. Uh, I would like to kind of speak to that um, from the undergraduate perspective. Please. What I'm hoping to see is sort of like the the pedagogical shift in what you're talking about in terms of the skills they're looking for. I'm thinking of the Google case study you brought up again um, and about this idea of fostering collaboration and participation as serious disciplines and looking at inter interdisciplinarity as a, as a paradigm for learning rather as than something that you kind of ask as a side question of like, well, why are we doing STEAM? Um, yeah. You know, so I, I think, like, for example, the Bass Connections is, like, the beginning of a really interesting way of saying we're going to intentionally instruct how to collaborate with your peers and then take different perspectives into account. And I think it's still such a, a rare um, way of thinking amongst undergraduates for the most part. Uh, I think increasingly so at Duke because people are very interested in different fields coming in here, as is the most case for most people. But... Um, I, I still think it's it's very much uh, marginalized. Um, but this yeah. is why I'm curious to see how over time what we're doing online is going to be translated sort of like in a more human interpersonal mm -hmm. level uh, in the classroom. So we'll see. Yeah. Great. I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, as you know, you all kind of wrote notes to me to us about why you should be in this class and what we tried to do was come up with an array of people who represented as many disciplines, as many schools, so it's all three universities in the area, undergraduates and graduate school students, uh, a, 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 as big an array of students as we could and that's pretty unusual because in many classes, especially at the um, senior undergraduate level or the graduate level, you're spending all your time with people who are in this, have the same disciplinary structures and the same disciplinary assumptions. Yeah, uh, anyone out there have some questions for one another? It shouldn't just be me answering questions. Anybody want to ask anybody else a question? There was a question that was actually on Twitter earlier in the week that I've been um, sort of reflecting on without responding to that I think would be interesting to open up to the group and to you. Um, and that was, in the first set of videos, you talk a lot about there being some type of social movement because of the MOOC. And there's so many ways that social movement can be thought about. And I was wondering if maybe we could discuss how we see education as a social movement or what that means to us, um, just so that there is a clearer idea of what our motivations are for the people that are seeing us as community TAs or instructors of this course. Yeah. So I'd be happy to start that, and I would love other people to jump in. So I don't think it's a social movement because of the MOOC. I think there, it's almost, again, this is a little bit deconstructionist. For the last two years, the whole conversation about higher education innovation has been governed just all over the media. It's been um, uh, dominated by corporations, venture capitalists, who are making things like Coursera, edX, Udacity, um, 
uh, what is the other one, 2-4, two, two, and other places, as if there are no di not ideas about innovation also coming from faculty, from students, or even from the general public who aren't in it to make a profit, but who are intensely concerned and interested with higher education. So my motivation in making the move was to have as many people as possible who were interested in higher education for the ideas and the cultural potential and issues of equality and access and social engagement and civic engagement have a platform where they could talk and maybe make a little noise so that you couldn't say anymore. I mean, the cliche is nobody but corporations have ideas. Uh, faculty and students don't have ideas. Uh, if you're going to change education, it has to be from outside because nobody within education ever changes. Well, that's just not true. But that has not been the media conversation. And um, click-through does matter. So having, it turns out, over 15,000 students in the MOOC and the Chronicle of Higher Education having two of you students write each week about what you're doing, having the Twitter streams, having the 70 universities that are part of the Future Ed Initiative, where there's small groups of people talking in their own communities about this. I think we are a very impressive substantive counterbalance to the cliche that you have to be a corporation and have a proprietary interest um, in making money and making profit in order to change education. I think we can also think about educational innovation without thinking about that, what the product profit motive for that is. So the movement I'm thinking about is a worldwide movement of people really thinking about the kind of educational innovation we want for our time period and that isn't about quarterly profit reports, it's really about what serves our world now. Um, I love it that our co-teacher out in California, David Palombalu, has his students reading the 1944 GI Bill, even to develop an ear for a conversation that has happened about higher education as a civic social good, as in fact an antidote to what we would now call income inequality, but in 1944 it would have just said, been, it would have been the inverse. This is the way into a middle class life, This is whether that's in manufacturing, whether that's in uh, technology, whether that's in teaching, whether that's in the arts, it's a, it's a way of having a, a, a more comfortable, affluent um, lifestyle. Uh, and, it, and the 1944 bill tried at least to be egalitarian. I, I want us to have that conversation again. It shouldn't just be innovation is about profit. So that's the, I have no, that's the only conversation that I'm dedicated to, and it has a million different ways of being expressed, and I hope that people do express it in a million different ways. I just want to uh, quickly point out that uh, the notion of higher education or education in general as a social or political movement has a very strong connection to Duke University, and in particular one Terry Sanford, mm -hmm. who in, in 1961 uh, did something that you know not many people uh, thought he could do that wasn't very popular, uh, raised taxes in order to uh, pay teachers more, 23 percent salary, uh, salary uh, raises. Uh, he raised 83 million dollars in taxes to do everything from improve schools, uh, to pay teachers more, to provide uh, different kinds of education to people with special needs. Um, so, <clears throat> I just wanted to make that quick note that uh, Duke University and especially Terry Sanford uh, know what it means to take seriously uh, education as a social and political movement. I, I would just like to speak on that a little bit. Um, before I actually came to Duke, I spent a lot of my time um, and at the Board of Education um, fighting for better educational practices for children with autism. Wow. And, and I was reading about this um, in the forums. I was getting a sense of frustration from teachers, you know, about you know, the numbers in their classrooms, the lack of support. And just my experience, um, and when I say fighting the school system, I literally mean fighting. I mean, I was threatened. It was really horrible. Um, what might might we be able to? I, and I'm not sure how much of this conversation goes there, but I'm, I guess my concern is is no matter how much I feel um, that we are innovative, 
I also have seen the bureaucracy and you know how do we fight past that I mean where where could we go or where could we even have a little bit of a kernel of inspiration to give teachers and other people who are trying to you know do what's right for the children in their classrooms right. well boy we've all been in that fight and it's a it's a it's a very 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 difficult one and fighting bureaucracy is a um, is not easy, and especially when it's it's very very top down. Um, so I guess I have to go back to that very idealistic thing about saying institutions are mobilizing networks in the sense that sometimes it takes one person finding another person who's also fighting and making alliances with that person and finding a way into the system and chiseling it where, wherever you can. It rarely makes the whole system change, but sometimes small things can have an impact and can move. And sometimes it's, I mean, this is why Malina, I think that was Melina speaking, I think this is why I'm so excited at having, and why we're teaching the extra class so we can have MFA students involved. I think artists have a particular uh, talent and ability to express what many of us want to express and don't know how to express in a passionate and creative way that can prod our thinking to another level. I mean, you know, I don't know if autism is a project that you do as an artist, but you know, one polemical film can sometimes change lives and change bureaucracy and or at least make an occasion for change that other people can then build on. And um, you know, having artists be involved in our designing higher education from scratch. I hope, Molina, that one of our um, institutions that we design, or maybe it'll be a feature of all of them, looks differently abled people as one possibility for the future of higher education and one way that we can think about that. Um, I also believe, and this is why we started with the Mozilla Manifesto to make the Field Notes for 21st Century Manifesto to make the Virtual Community Manifesto, it's really hard to come up with something from completely from scratch, so having a model and then build, and asking what the questions are and offering that model for other people to build on is very, very useful for social activism. So I'm hoping that we can have make some models that other people might be able to use and in the course of making our own models educate ourselves and be a phalanx of people who are educated about different forms of educational change. That said, I'm sure that what you went through was uh, unspeakably painful. Um, and you know, just myself, as I, I talk about this in class often, as somebody who is severely dyslexic, you know. It's a miracle I got through um, K through 12 education, and um, it was really kind of an accident. If I hadn't done incredibly well flukily on one math test that got me notice in the city of Chicago, throughout the city of Chicago, I would have probably been flunked out of the school system because there's some things I can't do at all. But I happened to get this insane score on a math test that got me singled out. That's that's way too much chance uh, mm -hmm. for our children and figuring out other ways of evaluating what kind of talent our children have to offer in different circumstances is something that I think, I hope will be one of our motivators in this class to think about different models of education. There are some questions and comments coming in from Twitter and our Q&A. So um, I just wanted to read those out. Um, Jade uh, posted on our back channel that a question from Twitter is, um, is there a counter-innovation narrative we can go with for a social movement? Um, and a response to that so far is the bureaucratic leveling potential of online was, is, it's most exciting to me. We kind of lost it in profiteering future ed. Um, and I don't know if we want to respond to that first. There's also comments um, from Tressie Cottom in our Q&A. Um, I, too, have questions about the political economy of online spaces and its translation into social movement frameworks. What would that look like structurally? Those are fancy questions. Um, <laughs> let me get through the one about the bureaucratizing. I mean, Haystack for 10 years was an open learning network, uh, participant generated. So it really um, bothered me and still bothers me a lot that we went from peer-to-peer -peer university, GitHub, uh, open spaces of um, learning and peer-to-peer -peer learning and you know even Wikipedia and in terms of 
uh, open communities to the top-down, more hierarchical ones. So that was part of my of my motivation in doing this. Could you take a MOOC and turn it into something else? And I have to say, in terms of the community of people who I'm meeting online through our class, people are reappropriating a bureaucratic system. And since there's no um, money involved for the participants, and since there's no re uh, prerequisite, it is a less bureaucratic system than any other form of formal education, so not anywhere near as open as open source peer-to-peer -peer learning could and should be. But it does provide the, a platform of access to many people who might not feel they have access to the highly intellectual communities of GitHub in one way or um, uh, Haystack or other places in another way. So I think it does provide, and that's why I was so interested in the anti-elite outcry from some of the people on the MOOC, like, hey, we're here because we cherish learning and it's free and we can get in here. We couldn't afford Duke. We couldn't even afford the local community college. Uh, we have jobs. This is important to us and we're, we're getting something out of this and we're contributing something. So I think that's a, an imperfect solution, but it's very few things in the world are perfect, so you know I'll go with that for now. Um, the counter-innovation narrative, I don't know. I think a counter-innovation narrative is an innovation narrative, but then I'm a deconstructionist. So I would say the status quo is also an innovation uh, narrative until it isn't, um, that things are constantly constantly changing. Um, uh, I don't mind the word innovation. I know it bothers some people. Uh, I don't mind the word change. I prefer change to innovation, but changing from what to what is always an issue. Change is not always good. Um, and Tessie's, com Tessie's comment about um, the political economy of online spaces. Um, there are political economies in every space and um, affordances and obstacles in every space. And how you, um, I think the single most important thing is to understand what those affordances and those obstacles are um, within all um, social spaces online and on site. Um, you know, I have friends who say, hey, I'm a, I'm a member of the trans community. If you think walking down a public street is a safe, open public space for me, you've never, been a tr you've never lived a trans life. You don't know what that's like. Um, you know, I, so I think thinking about the affordances of on-site and online public economies and political economies is essential for all of us at all times. And sometimes the on-site, online dichotomy helps us to think in more profound ways about what we're not thinking about in the other. Derrida says, um, oh, Jade, you put that up, that one of my favorite Derrida um, uh, interviews, where he says what deconstruction is about is showing how things that we think of as natural, just because there are habits, aren't natural at all, but are highly socially constructed in all kinds of subtle economic, political, social, cultural, um, technical, disciplinary ways. And denaturalizing our habits is to me one of the most important things we can do as humans. And I think online helps us to see more about what our habits are on site and vice versa. Um, if I could add to that just very quickly, one of the things that I think is really important when we consider things like the political economy of MOOCs, especially with a system like Coursera, is that it's a convergence of our social media practices and everything that circulates in that political economy um, along with the political economy of the higher education system. Um, so if we go back to where you started with looking at these courses that can only be offered by professors at top institutions is a direct quote from the company, not from you, um, that are sort of hand-picked. It's really hard to start um, thinking through a structural argument that only considers the technology aspect without thinking the other thing that it's sort of built itself on, um, which is access to this thing that people wouldn't have otherwise, thus the um, comments from the forums where people are saying, I wouldn't have the money to go to a community college, let alone Duke. Um, so there, there's just a lot of things to consider when you start thinking through that, and I think you see that when you look at the demographics of the participants who have self-disclosed information about themselves. Most people are working, um, most people are older, most people are well into their careers. These aren't um, typical undergraduate students, going back to the point of it not being a risk for university professors. Yeah. Um, so it, it's surfing and lots of various structures that haven't been able to come together in this way before. Um, in terms of open learning. So it, it's 
it's an interesting question. I don't know that we necessarily have a solid answer yet. Couldn't agree more. Those are exactly the kind of questions that um, I think we all need to be thinking about. Um, one, I think we should be closing up now because it's 10 after 5. Um, but one final thing, I'm hoping that um, this week, since we couldn't meet face to face and we were going to be doing, if this is for the face to face things, we were going to be doing a design sprint this week so you could get your first taste of. Um, designing your university from scratch, and then the second phase is actually pitching what your team decides is going to be the focus of its university, so we could make sure that we have three really different kinds of universities. There's going to be some horse trading and bartering and so forth, but we're missing a really important class today, so I'm hoping that um, in those groups that Casey sent you, she wrote a she wrote um, list at the bottom of the email she sent with all everybody's groups. I'm hoping you'll use Twitter or Google Hangouts or a Google Doc or any other format so that when you come to class next week, we've got my Google Hangout um, with um, Stanford. I'm going to be talking about how we measure the How We Measure chapter in my book with Stanford and UCSB. But after that, we'll be doing looking at the universities from scratch. I'm hoping you'll come into class with some preliminary work you've done online between now and then. Um, so basically, the assignment for next week is that mobilizing networks chapter of, the, of um, future thinking the Now You See It chapter, and maybe the, introdu the introduction in the Now You See It chapter, I'm sorry, and the How We Measure chapter of Now You See It, and some preliminary work in your groups, online, on-site. If you want to meet at a coffee house, that's fine with me. If you want to meet in, in a, uh, on Rap Genius, that's fine with me. But um, some work that you've been doing towards your higher education um, from scratch models, so we can start talking about those in class next time. Any um, questions on that? Any comments or questions on that? We we did get one more question on the back channel. I don't know if you want to take it, or I can post it into the forums and we can answer it there. Um, I think we probably should put it um, in the forums right now, just because um, it's already 10 after 5, 50, quarter after 5, and uh, I think we promised everybody an hour-long class tonight. Just it's getting cold. The streets are getting very, very icy. I don't know if you're all in your warm houses, but um, I'm from Chicago, and I was very dismissive of this as being a snow that would shut down the city, and I drove my husband a mile and almost got in an accident with somebody who didn't have snow tires trying to stop at a stop sign and skidding into my, just about into my car. So everybody, I, want, I, I feel like you need to get home and safe wherever you are. And um, if you don't have any questions, maybe we'll put that back into the forum. Um, Casey and ask it later. Great. Everybody, how you? Everybody home, safe, in a good place. Yep. Yes. Yep. We just fine here. Good. I'm at the yep. library at UNC, so I'm definitely <laughs> need to get home at some point. <laughs> get home, definitely, definitely. So take care, everybody. I'm so sorry we couldn't meet today. Uh, we could think about a lot of affordances. The affordance of the weather, <laughs> not much in our control. So thanks so much for being online and um, trying to meet together new groups this week. So you can come next week with um, higher ed from scratch with some basic ideas per your groups. Thanks. Sounds Bye. good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.